It's hard to believe the day has finally come, but this is the fifth in a five-part retrospective on the 2012 Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. A little over a month ago, I had never even seen anything from this series past the first couple of episodes, but now, 124 episodes later, I'm giving my thoughts on the show's fifth and final season, and then giving my final thoughts on the 2012 show entirely. This one was a shorter season, only containing 20 episodes as opposed to the usual 26, so I was very curious to see what was going to be different about the show this time around, because it was definitely going to be something. But before I even think about it, We've got to give a huge special thanks to Private Internet Access for being the sponsor of today's video. I'm sure you and the viewing audience are familiar with what a VPN is at this point, but if not, Private Internet Access is a virtual private network that encrypts your data like your IP address or your internet history, giving you more privacy and security when using the internet. So you won't be at risk of your data being stolen when connected to things like public Wi-Fi at an airport or a coffee shop or what have you. They also don't store your data at all, either. Using this, you can access the region-blocked content on streaming platforms, too, by connecting to the internet from those countries. Which is pretty handy! Private internet access is available on all platforms and protects an unlimited amount of devices with your subscription plan. Signing up for private internet access is risk-free with a money-back 30-day guarantee and has 24-7 customer support. To get in on this action, which I know you want to, you're going to want to check out PIAVPN.com slash Jay's Reviews, because with that you get 83% off plus 4 months completely free. How's that for a deal? That's PIAVPN.com slash Jay's Reviews. The link is in the description and the pinned comment. Having said that, let's get back to the show. Somebody commented on one of the previous videos asking where you can watch the 2012 TMNT series, and since we've reached the last video, I figured I'd talk about it now. But don't worry, this segment won't last 10 minutes like it did in the 2003 retrospective. In fact, it won't even last two. In the 2000s and before, you get a plethora of those tiny DVD sets that only had a couple of episodes on them, and for some shows, that was it as far as home video was concerned. But into the 2010s, things were a lot different. Now, the 2012 show still had a fair share of tiny DVD episodes that you'd find at Target or Walmart or whatever, but anybody who wants to watch this series doesn't need to collect them. The entire 2012 TMNT show is on Paramount+, Plus. if you happen to be the person in your friend group who owns an account there. But, if you are fond of physical media, and instead you can mosey on over to Amazon and pick up the complete series pack of TMNT 2012. All five seasons, every episode. And that's that. I don't actually own this box set, but I probably should pick it up since I do own the complete box set for the 1987 TMNT series and the fucking Next Mutation one season DVD. But on that note, I figured I'd update the world on the fact that in 2023, the world was finally given that which it hungered most for. A complete box set of the 2003 TMNT show. And yeah, that's what everyone in the world wanted the most, don't fact check that. All seven seasons and Turtles Forever finally together in an easily found and owned set. I pre-ordered that immediately, though I should warn everyone watching that the set itself is actually quite poor in quality. There is a video from the channel Remastering TMNT 2003 that went over, in detail, why the picture quality on this set was a mess. I can say it's a win that we got it though, but it not being good was definitely disappointing. But I guess I can talk more about the 2003 series being back later in the video. So to get into Season 5 of the 2012 show properly, I'll give a recap of anyone who missed the last video. Season 4 of the 2012 show was meant to be the last one when it was conceived, and it certainly shows. Half of it was spent in an odyssey across the universe trying to undo the ending of the third season. Then the back half was building up to the finale where the Turtles and their allies would battle and defeat the Super Shredder. In the penultimate episode, Master Splinter was killed off a second time with no time-traveling do-over in sight. They wanted the ending to carry some real weight to it. However, on July 10th of 2015, Nick had ordered a 20-episode fifth season, which was a few months before Season 4 had started airing. I was pretty curious about how this one was going to go, given the fact that the first two TMNT cartoons also had phases where they clearly extended past their natural expiration. But those seasons still produced worthwhile episodes and characters that people remember fondly to this day. So a season that goes past the intended finale certainly shouldn't be counted out before giving it a try. I will say this though, this season from the outside looking in definitely seemed as though it existed to fill a TMNT content gap between 2012 Season 4 and the next show, Rise of the TMNT, which started in 2018. I mean, Rise was announced for a 2018 release date before the fifth season had even started airing. So the focus was already shifting to the next thing. And then the fifth season we got did that late stage TMNT thing where they change up the intro. But then they also did that thing where they added a subtitle to the series as it's now Tales of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Totally unique. Not saying that means it's going to be bad, but it just made me curious how it's going to go. Contrary to all the previous seasons where I said that an issue for me was how the seasons would have one main arc and toss a bunch of side episodes into the mix ultimately made the arcs take way longer to unfold than they probably needed to, Season 5 is actually pretty focused on current stories. 
The season gets its name from the fact that it's a collection of stories. The first four episodes are about the revival of Shredder, then two episodes about the return of Lord Dreg, three in the dimension of Usagi, one standalone flashback episode, three in an alternate future, four that deal with horror movie monsters, and a final crossover with the 87 series in the last three episodes. So this season doesn't have an overall story, just sets of stories that take place one after another. I don't really have a preference either way, but I just thought it was interesting to note since technically this approach does mean that my long-running issue has now been somewhat fixed. Though I feel like I have even less to say about this season than I did the other ones. In the first arc, I thought it was pretty surprising that they dive right into reviving Shredder as a plotline so soon after his death, but that was before I saw what the plot structure of Season 5 was. The premise is that Tiger Claw is leading a cult of loyalists that are trying to bring Shredder back with the power of a demon called Cravaxis, voiced by Mark Hamill, and the Turtles plus April, Casey, and Karai try to stop it from happening. And ultimately, they need to defeat Shredder and Cravaxis once a bunch of spirits are released from the afterlife, including Splinter, who gets to beat up a few spirits himself. I think the Turtles trying to stop Tiger Claw and other Loyalists was enough of a threat for these episodes that I don't really feel like reviving Shredder was actually necessary, though. When reflecting, I don't feel like he really added much to the episodes, especially since he plunged both himself and Cravaxis into the underworld at the end. I think using his revival with a demon was good enough as a threat, but not as a plotline that actually happened, since I don't feel like he did much that was interesting, or furthered his character from what we already got in the first four seasons. But still, these were good episodes and started the season off well. But once that threat is eliminated, you get a two-part episode that wraps up all the space sci-fi elements of the show. Lord Dreg has made it to Earth, and with the help of the Neutralizer, who's hunting the Utroms, they intend on killing the heroes for good. I don't know how Dreg survived being sent into the Void of Space in Season 4, as that's not addressed at all, but he's back now. In this episode, the other two Salamandrian characters from Season 4 are back, and the male one has a bone to pick with the Neutralizer, so that adds some tension. Plus, you get a bunch of returning characters like Agent Bishop teaming up with the heroes. It's another good set of episodes, although it is funny how they tried pulling a Mikey death and then later a Mikey sacrifice in the same episode, because that's surely gonna happen, right? Though in retrospect, what I thought was kind of sad about this set of episodes was that after it was over, the series basically drops Casey, April, and Karai as main characters. April and Casey do cameo in the horror movie monster arc and also get brief cameos in the final set of episodes, but the fight against Lord Dreg is the last time they're focused on, and although it seems some would prefer the story just be about the turtles, but I don't know. I got pretty used to April at least being in almost every episode. She became a disciple of Splinter that was, by the end of season 4, roughly on the level of the turtles, so her and Casey not being in the following 7 episodes is something I definitely took notice of. But what does happen is the next three episodes see the Turtles transported to the dimension of Miyamoto Usagi, another comic book character that the TMNT have crossed over with in just about every incarnation. Though I wouldn't be surprised if more people recognized him as a TMNT guest character than his own star at this point. Anyway, they have to work with Usagi across three episodes to transport this royal kid to a mountain temple. Despite not getting as much airtime as the 2003 Usagi, I think this version managed to be a capable badass that left an impression in a fraction of the screen time, which was impressive. The writers and artists exploring new concepts because of this alternate dimension, like the Turtles getting dressed up as samurai, possibly a reference to TMNT3, and then spending an episode dealing with Tanuki and a giant spider cave before finally reaching the mountain in the third episode. Episode 10 is a one-off where we see Splinter telling a story to the toddler Turtles, and this is our first time seeing them too, about when they were just starting out. I really loved this episode because Splinter's interactions with the baby and toddler Turtles is really cute. The episode including moments like seeing why Raph's plastron is cracked, as the Turtles and Splinter were being pursued by the Krang who wanted to make sure there were no stray mutants, but Splinter had the skills to evade them until they eventually found the subway tunnel that became the lair. And at the end, Splinter gives the Turtles their weapons for the first time. It's just a nice, nostalgic episode now that the series is about to end, and it's really good to see Splinter again, because as I've said, this is definitely my favorite incarnation of the character that I've ever seen. Though while I watched it, I did think of a few things that required me to bust out the old tinfoil, because there are some inconsistencies here. Such as the fact that Toddler Leo is Seth Green's voice, but what the heck, the show clearly established that Leo having a much different voice is a result of battle damage. Though on that note, Season 4 had a flashback to the Happy Mutation Day scene from Season 1 where Seth Green redubbed Jason Biggs' lines, so talk about inconsistent, am I right? Also, while this isn't a plot hole per se, the fact that Splinter fully battled the Krang and saw their true forms and never mentioned that later is pretty sus, Splinter. I mean, imagine if in episode 2 when Mikey says, Like that robot with the brain thingy. Give it a rest. Splinter was like, no my sons, remember the story I told you all about us being pursued by robo-aliens? This has gotta be them. But I can't even call that a plot hole, as maybe he just didn't want to say. There is certainly precedent for that. But like always, I remind that when talking about things that are good, plot hole discourse is just me poking fun for a laugh. I really enjoyed this episode, and it was probably my favorite one from season 5. Now here's where things get pretty bizarre. 
The next three episodes aired are actually the last three that ever got produced. The Raphael Mutant Apocalypse Saga. If you're watching the show now, it might feel like a really odd out of left field move, but this is a series of episodes that take place decades in the future following some massive mutation incident where the entire planet was mutated and those who were not died. The episode follows Raph in his old age alongside a robotic Donatello who linked his brain up with a rebuilt metalhead as they journey through the wasteland to fight and survive. So what happened here is that the creators of the show wanted to do this definitive ending for the series that would make it so the studio couldn't just artificially keep the show going or do some revival later on that would add on to the show that was made. So this was their idea to end the series. But I guess Nickelodeon didn't like that plan, so instead, they aired this intended final set of episodes in the middle of the season as a three-part episode event and explicitly branded it as an alternate universe, thus making the episodes effectively non-canon to the actual series. To be honest, I prefer it this way, because I didn't really like these episodes that much anyway. Not to say that was because I thought it was bad or something, I just wasn't really my thing. I've never watched a Mad Max movie, so maybe I'd enjoy that, but episodes of Ninja Turtles where a lot of it is car chases in the desert with a lot of explosions and things like that, I just thought it was boring. Sean Astin does an excellent job leading the episode as the older Raph, though. His design kind of gave me some Night Watcher vibes from TMNT 2007. And as they met with the other turtles, I was very happy to see that Ice Cream Kitty survived all these years. That was the most important thing. Though I felt kind of stupid for not even realizing Leo was the villain chasing them until the very last second. But anyway, looking at this episode saga as though it were the canon ending, despite it closing on a somewhat optimistic note of the brothers finally back together again, the entire world getting destroyed in a mutagen apocalypse is kind of a downer state of affairs for the world, and it also comes out of nowhere if you watch the other episodes. So I'm more than glad to look at this as an alternate dimension, even removed from the fact that these were probably my least favorite episodes to watch. My second least favorite arc was the penultimate one. Like I said earlier, it was the Turtles traveling in time with Renette to battle classic movie monsters. Savanti is recruiting monsters for his army, including the Mummy, the Werewolf, Dracula, Frankenstein's monster, and so on. These are episodes with plenty of entertaining moments and good battles, like when Raph gets turned into a vampire at one point and it takes almost the whole arc to turn him back, but I still came out of this arc thinking, yeah, this is alright, because the Turtles seeing these monsters and the show paying homage to the Universal classics is nice, but... That doesn't really do much for me as an episode. The Farmhouse arc also paid homage to a bunch of classic slasher movies, and the reason I didn't even dive into that is because I didn't notice because I haven't seen most of them. The figures in these episodes are so iconic that I obviously wouldn't even need to get it, but like I said, when the reference is the backing of the arc, I thought it was fine. It was a set of well-made episodes, but I didn't really think anything was mind-blowing or noteworthy here either. To close the show, you get a three-episode arc where the 2012 Turtles team up with their 1987 counterparts again. It being three parts gives the story more room to breathe than it had in Season 4, where it was also connected to the Turtles in Space Saga. Now that it is an arc dedicated to the crossover, we get to see the Technodrome, Shredder, Bebop, and Rocksteady, and all that. To start, I have to give props. These episodes, with the limited time they spend in the 87 world, actually managed to really up their game from the previous seasons in terms of design. I thought the scenes from the 87 world just looked cheap. But these scenes now look pretty on model when comparing it to the designs from Season 1 of the original series, which I thought was impressive. All the original actors are back again, though James Avery, the original Shredder, had passed away in 2013, so for him, they got Kevin Michael Richardson to portray him, and I thought he was pretty funny as this Shredder. Making the villains of the classic series really bumbling idiots was a pretty good routine in that show, and I think that was captured here pretty well as they accidentally leave Bebop and Rocksteady behind and put an ad in the paper for a mutant rhino and warthog and thus hire the Bebop and Rocksteady from the 2012 dimension. As for the Turtles, I was once again surprised by just how much of a gag they made these old Turtles, given how the team behind the 2012 show respected it while making their new one. But I think it's pretty funny if you just go along with it. Wait, wait! You can't kill us! This is a kid's show! I mean, the whole idea that the classic turtles suck at fighting is obviously not the intention behind the original series. Clunky animation in the show's later seasons is just a product of the time and the budget and all that stuff, and they're not using their weapons as just classic censorship. If you watch season one of the classic series, it was certainly not as goofy as they're portrayed here, but like I said, if you go along with it, the jokes actually got a really good laugh out of me. But if I swing my sword at them, I could actually cut someone, and that would hurt. So what do you use that sword for? To slice pizza? Duh! Are you guys even real ninjas? It was also nice, as stated before, to see April, Casey, and Karai return to being main characters too. And it came with some surprises, like Bebop and Rocksteady decided to become good guys at the end. It was a really fun set of episodes, I thought. Though, with the final scene taking place in the 87 world, that does mean we don't get much of a goodbye for the 2012 heroes. To be fair, you could just say Carmageddon was supposed to be that, but like I said, I didn't really care for that much anyway. 
But the good news is, I think season 4 still stands as a pretty good ending for the series, and thus, season 5 didn't really need to give them a massive send-off, instead giving us more adventures in this world, which I suppose is what the title's trying to convey. That's pretty much all I have to say on season 5. I thought it was 20 episodes of TV that were decent to good to great even, which is how I felt about the whole show. This season didn't really need to exist, I suppose, but for what it's worth, I thought it was a decent extension of the series. Something that I would say is above fast forward and definitely back to the sewer, if I'm honest. And I didn't even hate those seasons anyway, they had really good high points, but were kinda slogs to get through when they weren't hitting as high. But with us already in conclusion territory, that begs the question, TMNT 2003 versus 2012, which do I prefer? Well that should be fairly obvious. The one I like more is the one I have seen every episode of multiple times. The 2003 TMNT is gonna be one of those things I'll think of when pondering what shows have impacted me the most creatively. And the 2012 show will be a fun series I watched once and enjoyed my time with, but I don't have much to say about it besides that. But that's the thing. Before the 2012 show, from what I gather, the TMNT community was engaged in a years-long which cartoon is better war between the 87 and 03 series. Today, it seems like most people feel as though the 2003 and 2012 shows are the best TMNT shows, but there isn't a clear consensus on which one is better. My response to that is, I don't think there really needs to be one. I think there's more than enough room in this town for two really well done TMNT shows. I prefer the 2003 series for many reasons, and I think it just executes its ongoing story much better than the 2012 show did. For example, in the first five seasons, the 2003 series didn't have nearly the amount of drop plot lines that the 2012 show did. That show was so interconnected that episodes you thought had nothing to do with anything were a part of the world building of larger arcs. Take the way Notes from the Underground seemed like a filler arc, but became one of the major ongoing stories between the first four seasons. When the Turtles said they would come back and cure the mutants at the end of Notes Part 3, you'd think it would be like many cartoons where that just never happens, only for it to happen in Season 2. In the 2012 show, you'll have things like the Pulverizer being mutated and Don promising to find a cure for him, only for that to never happen. In fact, his being frozen in a glass jar is a background prop in Don's lab throughout the entire rest of the show. Not like I was really invested in that anyway, but I mean to say that the 2003 series executed long-running stories more precisely and concisely as well which I have gone into earlier in the 2012 retrospective. But that doesn't mean the 2012 show doesn't get a ton of stuff right either. I mean, this is easily the most consistent TMNT show of the first three cartoons. I mean, there was no radical shift in tone, no wildly inconsistent animation, no art design upheaval, or any of the things that the first two cartoons were guilty of. Instead, this show told its story from start to finish, and the quality of the animation and action and storytelling just improved with time, and watching all these episodes over the course of a month, I just really respected the talent on display. It was a really solid show. Though with this series, I noticed the same thing I do with most TMNT shows. Obviously, the longer a cartoon runs on for it, the less popular it will become by the end. I mean, if you were like 10 years old when the 2012 show came out, then you'd be 15 by the time it ended. You're probably just more interested in other stuff. 2012 season 1 getting over 2 million in the ratings every episode, but most season 5 episodes not even getting 1 million a lot of the time. This gives me the chance to add on to what I had said in my Back to the Sewer video in 2022. This seems to just be a Ninja Turtles thing. I said the Turtles don't have the staying power that Batman or Spider-Man have. People pointed out that all the TMNT shows have run longer than any show starring those two. But what I meant was, regardless of that, Batman or Spider-Man are just kind of always at a baseline of popularity that remains pretty consistent year by year. But then with the Turtles, this has happened three times, where they will explode in popularity with the new generation and then gradually decrease and then the brand goes away for a bit and then it comes back swinging with the new generation. That was the arc of the brand in the late 80s into the early 90s, the 2000s, and the 2010s, and now we're on to the fourth generation of TMNT. And we'll see if it keeps going down the same path again. The Turtles are some of the most iconic characters of all time, and they will remain popular forever. What I'm just saying is, is that it always seems to go in generational cycles. I've always wondered why that was, and while watching Season 5 of 2012, I thought, Perhaps it's because of the cross-genre appeal of TMNT. I mean, the show will always start as Ninja Turtles vs. Foot Ninjas, but then by the end it's a show about space aliens and different dimensions and time travel and all that. People don't seem as interested in all that stuff, but it is simultaneously a TMNT staple in almost every incarnation. Although on that note, 2012 show also had to deal with Nickelodeon getting sporadic in the air dates with the last two seasons. Sometimes there'd be months between episodes, and other times there'd be multiple episodes dropping back to back. Lack of consistency doesn't help things. But regardless of all that, I think the 2012 Turtles deserve to be remembered quite fondly. If you think about it, this era of TMNT had quite a large impact on the brand. This was the first cartoon made after the Viacom buyout in 2009, so it was the first Nickelodeon Turtles, the company that has continued owning the TMNT ever since. 
and in this time period, the brand expanded beyond what it ever was before. The 2012 Turtles were the first ones to cross over with Batman in the comics, for example, which I think set the stage for the TMNT to be so popular in crossover media to this day. Like that comic being adapted as the Batman vs. TMNT film, the Turtles appearing in the Injustice games, and now Fortnite. A major stride made for the IP that first happened during the 2012 Turtles era. And it was a show that you can tell the cast and crew were super passionate about, and it even gave us the chance to hear Rob Paulson get a second round of voicing a Ninja Turtle, and he absolutely crushed it both times. This was also a series that got the 1987 TMNT cast reunited for multiple crossover episodes, and it introduced new staples to the franchise like April being the same age as the Turtles, a major change that has stuck ever since. A lot of great things went into this show, and a lot of great things came as a result of it, is what I mean to say. What I do find interesting to look back on is how, I feel like today, the 2012 Turtles are in a similar position that the 2003 Turtles were during the 2012 era. If you recall my 2003 retrospective, I had said that during the 2010s, and even when I made those videos, that I felt like the Turtles I liked, which used to dominate the brand, were treated as though they didn't exist anymore. As TMNT became one of those brands where it was either a celebration of its nostalgic roots, or a showcase of new things but that period between was largely forgotten. I feel like the 2012 Turtles are in that position now, which is why I highlighted how big this era of TMNT actually was just a moment ago. Since if this is anything like the 2000s Turtles, I'm sure the nostalgia for the 2012 era will eventually come around. It was kind of funny. My 2003 retrospective was all about the Turtles era that pop culture doesn't talk about anymore, only for 2023 to be the year that we get the 2003 series complete on DVD, Playmates including 2003 figure reissues as part of their classics collection, and Super 7 announcing they're doing collector's figures based on the 2003 series next. Exactly what I predicted in the Turtles Forever video. Now, I'm not gonna say I brought the 2003 series back to life. Now, I'm not as arrogant as that. But I'm not gonna say that I didn't either. But anyway, I'm getting off subject. My point is, now that we're in this fourth era of TMNT where the nostalgia has now extended to include the 2000s, it seems like 2010 stuff is being celebrated less. But I'm confident in the fact that these turtles will be seen again someday, which I think is a nice optimistic note to end the video series on. Like I said at the beginning, I had no idea how this is going to turn out at the start, because I had no extensive history with this show before making these videos, but I think I found a groove with it after the first few. I think this was still fun while not being anything like the 2000s retrospective I did. I enjoyed doing it, and I hope the audience enjoyed watching it, even if it wasn't as grand as that 2000s retrospective. But with that said, this is the last video for 2023. I hope the longtime sub is looking forward to what's coming in the new year, because I think there's a lot to be excited for if you're a longtime subscriber. But I think that's enough for today, so to close, I'll just say what I always do. If you made it this far into the video, I thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.